day, I serve Allegheny and Washington counties. Um, this is my second four years in the Maryland General Assembly. Before that, I was president of the Board of County Commissioners. And uh, know a lot of you in the room and appreciate your love for rural Maryland as I do. But I wanted to start off with you with six little words. Now I'm hoping these six little words will help you to explain what the ingredients are in the sauce in this whole room here that makes the greatest impact for rural Maryland. These six little words, the ingredients, are faith, trust, hope, confidence, love, and attitude. So please indulge me with this little story, and I assure you it will be worth your 30 seconds as you listen. Once all the villagers decided to pray for rain, and on the day of prayer all the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. That's faith. When you throw babies in the air, they laugh because they'll know that they'll catch that you will catch them. That's trust. Every night before we go to bed, without any assurance of being alive the next morning, we all set the alarm to wake up. That's hope. We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. That's confidence. We see the world suffering, but we still get married and we have children. And those who know me, we have lots of children. That's love. An old man's shirt, on an old man's shirt, was written a sentence. I'm not 80 years old. I'm sweet 16 with 64 years of experience. Now that's attitude. May these six little words motivate everyone in this room, those who love rural Maryland and the communities they serve, achieve their goal in the upcoming session and beyond through collaboration and innovation. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our panel. We have the, uh, from the Department of Commerce, we have Secretary Kelly Schultz. Please. From the Department of the Environment, we have Assistant Secretary Suzanne Dorsey. Thank you. Special Assistant to the Secretary, Mr. Bunky uh, Laffman, from the Department of Natural Resources. We originally were going to have Secretary Brinkley from the Department of Budget and Management and my understanding is that his homework to get the budget together has not been done yet, and he cannot come until that budget is ready. No, I, I digress. I, so he, he sends his regards. First, what we would like to do is listen to Secretary Kelly Schultz. Kelly Schultz brings a wealth of knowledge to the Maryland Department of Commerce for her years of experience in government, in the private sector, and as a small business owner. She had previously served as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation. Since her confirmation in February of 2015, and is also a former member of the Maryland House of Delegates. At DLLR, she was responsible for managing an agency with nearly 2,000 employees, an operating budget of more than $375 million. Under her leadership, Maryland's apprenticeship program grew to its highest level since 2008, with more than 10,000 apprenticeships statewide. DLLR's both innovative and DLR's employment advancement right now, Maryland's program received national recognition for both innovation and effectiveness and was named one of the top 25 programs in 2018 Innovation in American Government Award Competition. A former member of the Maryland House of Delegates representing Frederick County, 
She served on economic matters from 2011 to 2015. In addition to local issues, then Delegate Schultz took special interest in legislation uh, relating to the banks and other financial institutions, business, occupation, and professions, economic development, labor and employment, unemployment insurance, and workers' compensation. Prior to embarking on a career of public service, Secretary Schultz sold real estate, worked as a program manager for a defense contractor, and was part owner of a cybersecurity firm. She has received several awards, including the Outstanding Recent Alumni Award from Hood College in 2011, and is proud to participate as a member in many local community organizations, including the Liberty Town Unionville Lions Club, the Walkersville Volunteer Fire Company. Kelly is also a past board member of the Frederick County Habitat for Humanity. Secretary Schultz obtained her associate's degree from Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, and later obtained her bachelor's in arts and political science from Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. A native of Warren, Michigan, Kelly currently lives in Frederick County, Maryland with her husband, John Noel, and their two sons, Brandon and Bradley. Without further ado, the talented Ms. Kelly Schultz. Thank you. Thank you. You have eaten your salads, your main course, your dessert by now after all of that. I'm sorry you all had to sit through that. There is an abbreviated version of the bio that's floating out there somewhere. We'll make sure Kyle makes sure every has an abbreviated one. Um, good morning, almost afternoon to everyone. It's great to be back at this summit. This is um, one of my favorite times of the year to talk about everything rural Maryland. The last time I was here at the summit, I was the Secretary of Labor, and we talked about a, a lot of really fun, uh, exciting opportunities in rural Maryland and different ways in order to be able to approach the, the workforce issues. And so now you have the new me, the new version, and we're talking about businesses, but isn't it ironic that they go hand in hand? Right? So businesses need workers, workers need you know viable businesses, and that's how economy grows, and that's how we expand. At the Department of Commerce, we have three main goals. We are to help and assist um, to the retention of those businesses that are here and help them expand and grow, and then also to be able to attract new businesses to the state of Maryland and to each of your areas. And that's where we spend a lot of our time. The other part of our time with the Department of Commerce, which I believe also goes hand in hand with economic growth, is uh, tourism um, and our film and our arts industries that are out there to be able to make sure that we have a viable, um, thriving um, cultural aspect to the state of Maryland, which just tourism alone brings $18.1 billion to the state of Maryland um, last year. So that's really exciting. The other exciting part about that is that most of those tourism dollars come from our rural communities. Uh, when we talk about Western Maryland, when we talk about the Eastern Shore, we talk about the mountains and the waterways and everything in between, we're very, very fortunate to be able to have thriving industries when it comes to those areas. And I know that uh, the good delegate, my, my former colleague in the House, has um, some very specific questions to kind of talk about. But um, I just finished at the department. We decided after the legislative session to do a collaboration tour. Um, so many of you I have probably seen on our Commerce Collaboration Tour. We just finished all 23 counties. We spent a full day in each county talking about economic development growth with all of the elected officials, business owners, community members, to be able to make sure that what you're doing in your particular regions and your areas is what you want the state to be helping with. And when your local areas are um, collaborating, together and the state is able to collaborate together, and you bring in all the other partners, then you have successful programs, you have thriving uh, businesses, you have a thriving plan in order to be able to reach a successful prosperity. At the end of last legislative session, the reason for this collaboration tour was because it became very apparent to me that all of my friends, like the good delegate here, um, his colleagues, uh, did not think as highly about economic development and growth as I thought about it in the state. Um, it was a little bit shocking to me, some of the, um, the, the backlash that we got about some of the programs, some of the tools that we have in our, our toolkit. 
because the, the consensus was that um, providing businesses with too many opportunities and too many incentives takes away from the people and we should take away the opportunities in those parts of our toolkit that are going to business entities. And I said, well, that's really interesting because those business entities in parts of our community are those that are helping to fund and pay revenues. And we want to be able to make sure, but more importantly, those businesses are creating the jobs. So we decided to change the narrative a little bit at the Department of Commerce and take a real hard look at what we can talk to the, uh, talk to the legislators about, talk to community members about, talk to all of the other elected officials at whatever capacity to say, listen, we're not creating prosperity so that we can go to a ribbon cutting, even though they're fun create a better bottom line for those corporations and those business owners, even though that's necessary, right? To be able to add extra development to the, to the areas in order to be able to create additional tax revenue for the counties, even though that's really important as well, as we know. Why we're really doing it is for those individuals that are able to have those jobs those new careers that perhaps never ever would have come into those areas before, right? We're creating prosperity with a purpose. We're creating an opportunity for an individual, going back to my labor days, we're creating an opportunity for that individual to perhaps have that job for the first time that's offering benefits. Perhaps for the first time that's allowing them to save up some money for their own transportation, which in the rural areas is really important being able to save up enough money to perhaps put a down payment on a new house or providing additional resources for their children that they may not have had before. So when we talk about economic development and growth and prosperity at the Department of Commerce and within our circles in the state of Maryland, we're not talking about the bottom line. We're talking about individuals, our beautiful, beautiful assets, our capital, our human capital that we have here in the state and what we can do in order to be able to help them with their own personal prosperity. And we can go on from there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Our second panel, panelist, please. I'd like to introduce our uh, panelist, Assistant Secretary uh, to the Department of Environment, Ms. Suzanne Dorsey. Suzanne Dorsey has a doctoral in coastal oceanography and a master's in marine science. Her background includes research science, grassroots environmentalism, education, and public service. She emphasized connection to the environment and works to find ways for all people to relate and to have them appreciate the environment. An ecologist, and she focuses on interconnectivity between different habitats and between humans and habitats. With over 30 years experience working towards conservation milestones, Suzanne has learned to trust relationships on the key to success. By listening to and respecting different views, we forge partnerships, craft solutions, and secure clean air, water, and land. As science sheds more light on the complex of our systems, solutions need to be crafted and addressed multiple environmental outcomes while supporting a robust economy. Now at MBE, Suzanne works in water and science administration on bay restoration and other major issues that require cross-agency collaboration on climate uh, resiliency. Let's give a round of applause for Assistant Secretary Dorsey. Thank you. You know, this, uh, this is an important summit, um, and the rural economies and rural peoples of Maryland represent a part of who we are as a state. So it's, it's a great privilege to be here on behalf of Secretary Grubble in the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, the mission of the Maryland Department of the Environment is to restore the environment for the health and well-being of all Marylanders. And as the regulatory arm of our state, we seek to actually help private and government agencies make sure that all people of Maryland have clean air, clean water, and a clean land environment. So Secretary Grumbles especially has, has been a leader um, with Governor Hogan 
in addressing some of our climate change issues that really have impacted our rural communities. Um, farmers know that weather has become flashier. Um, flooding in rural areas has been a consistent area of concern. Um, in 2019, we uh, put together a practical approach to climate change that seeks to decrease the causes, increase resiliency, reduce greenhouse gas, while delivering on a green economy that builds jobs. This year, our ambitious plan is aggressive. It has a sense of urgency. It's achievable. It's collaborative. It's bipartisan. It's bold. And it estimates about 11 and a half billion dollars in increased economic output, in addition to 11,000 uh, additional jobs. And Secretary, I want to thank you for not just that word jobs, it's so antiseptic, right? That's people, that's human beings, that's families, that's our state's well-being. And this false dichotomy that it's the environment or it's business, it's the environment or jobs, that's really hindering our success. It's the environment and jobs. It's the environment and family. It's businesses who are leading the way to protecting our state, our state's land, air, and water, and our climate and future. So please don't get caught up in that false dichotomy. That's just a, another tool that's used to divide us. Um, we have the public, this plan for our climate available for public comment. We're going to be holding a series of public meetings throughout the state. Um, it emphasizes clean transportation, for instance, um, healthy soil initiatives for our farmers, um, increased energy efficiencies, and of course, better air quality and water quality to help our, the health of our children, our families, and of course, the vitality of the bay. You know, for 20 years, Maryland's air quality has been on a path to continuing improvement. We're in compliance with our federal standards. And we, last, this year, 2019, we were able to put $2.5 million in funding for electric and alternative fuels for our children's school buses. That means those idling school buses are not putting the particulate matter in the air that can impact the health and well-being of our children. I think that's an incredible step. With the Chesapeake Bay, we put forward an ambitious phase three implementation plan um, that thanks to my colleagues at the Hughes Center really was um, an integrated plan that brought together the needs of our rural communities, of our agricultural sector, as, as well as our local and urban governments. Um, it was extensive engagement um, that sought a plan to balance the responsibilities between the different sectors. So wastewater treatment, stormwater runoff, septic, agriculture, everybody's playing a, a really crucial role in this. Um, the plan also factors in climate change for the first time and acknowledges that some of our past plans may need to be modified moving forward. It protects local rivers, trout streams, all across the, straight, the state. Our local environment where all of our constituents live, be it right next to the Chesapeake Bay or in Garrett County far away, everybody benefits from making sure that our land and our water is protected. It's a comprehensive plan that keeps us on track for a bountiful environment, a bountiful Ches Chesapeake. So, and these, these watersheds, when we work in rural areas and we work in Garrett County, they may not want to drive the three hours down here to Chesapeake Bay, but they do want to go fishing in their local streets. And that those brook trout are an important part of their local economies as well. And, as somebody who left 25, you know, I think 30 years ago, after working in the Chesapeake Bay, you know, we turned a real corner in the Chesapeake Bay. We've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. I don't want to minimize it, but the indicators in our Chesapeake Bay are bay grasses, our, our um, shellfish harvest are extraordinary. We're not done. Hard work is ahead of us, but I think it's really crucial that we take a moment to recognize that there's been 
a sense of resiliency restored to our Chesapeake Bay. It's withstood this uh, recent couple of years of increased rainfall, which put additional nutrients into the bay. We didn't lose all the, the um, bay grasses like we thought we might. They persisted. That shows a real resiliency. And I hope it inspires all of us to keep working. The Chesapeake Bay is at the core of our culture here in Maryland. It's such an important resource that represents so much to our rural economies, really to all of us as Marylanders. And I hope that you're inspired to keep going on that work. Um, stop pointing those fingers between rural and urban sectors. We're all doing our part, and we all have an important part in the future. Governor Hogan invested $5 billion in the Chesapeake Bay since taking office. Um, and he's been seeking to push the Congress to continue that. We are um, funding the 2025 milestone for STEM goals that are um, articulated in our phase three plan. This year, we also saw the Conowingo Dam Agreement, $200 million in environmental projects to improve water quality in the, upper, in the lower Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay. $200 million, that includes $19 million to support agriculture and forestry, and it's a holistic strategy that even includes, for instance, a pilot study to look at how can we use those sediments trapped behind the, the dam in a beneficial way. So we also, I, I know uh, whenever I travel to rural communities, they, they, folks wag their finger at me and say, what is Baltimore doing about those sewer overflows? You know, what's the point of us working to clean up the bay if Baltimore keeps dumping uh, dumping sewer sludge into it? And in 2019, uh, MDE entered into a consent decree with Baltimore to address these sewer overflows. There's additional control measures and transparency with the public, and the consent decree will eliminate sewer overflows with construction projects to address outdated infrastructure by 2022. So we're making significant progress there. I'm also excited to share with you that um, the number of Maryland children with elevated levels of blood decreased by 13%. And the number of lead poisonings in the state of Maryland is at its lowest level since 1994 when data was first collected. We're doing our part to make sure that our, our kids are healthy. A lot of rental units have actually been removed from our lead registry program because they've eliminated all lead in our household. There's really good news out there. The relentless optimism that our keynote speaker talk, talked about has got to inspire us to keep doing, keep moving towards the path to success. So we, at MDE, we really seek to serve our communities. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, we do inspections and we might have to give a violation to folks. Um, you, you come to us for permits and that can be challenging. But we really try to listen to you. We've streamlined to improve our delivery time on permits. We've got new general permits to simplify how we do business. Um, we have more work to do. We want to hear from you. What can we do better? Um, how can we make permitting make sense? Um, we recognize that some efforts like stream restoration, flood mitigation are beneficial. We've got to work really hard to make sure that we move these through quickly and we don't treat you like polluters. So we're working hard on that. We're supporting our permit customers. And we continue to hold accountable folks that don't meet their permit goals and standards. Um, in the Hogan administration, enforcement has been above average for the last 20 years. We can continue to hold accountable. So much more. Um, I, I just want to close with a story because one of, uh, and talk about success in our, our state, we often talk about our leaders, but I really want to recognize our state employees. I want to let you know that I recently held a, a retirement party for somebody who had served the state for 43 years. You know, in the state of Maryland, we want to make sure your tax dollars are protected. You do not have funding for the state party. I mean, you served the state for 43 years. The state employees come together, we pool our money, and we have a social and a conference room. We pool our money and we go to a local restaurant, we buy a gift card. 
So we don't waste your money, we don't waste tax dollars, um, even when the service is expensive and uh, a source of real pride. Right before Thanksgiving, I was at a conference like this, and lit, my phone lit up as well as several of my colleagues. Um, there was a small community in St. Mary's County, about 42 homes that were without water. One of my colleagues, my staff members in the water supply was at home taking a day off, and he sprung into action. He made sure that these homes who were served by a private well had water. He got a tanker truck of water there, a generator, and somebody to sit on that tanker truck and generator and make sure that homes had water, those 42 homes had water. That weekend, our staff from management to the lowest level ensured that A, the water was flowing through the weekend, and that by Monday, we had an access order, our AGs were involved in this, an access order, so that Monday morning, first thing, uh, we worked with Maryland Environmental Service to ensure that the Environmental Service was taking over that well, fixing it, and supplying water for 42 homes. They worked all weekend for 42 homes. They would have done that for 4,200 homes or 42,000 homes. But I think one of the unsung heroes are our staff members to make sure that all citizens of Maryland are protected, that you have clean air, clean water, clean land, and that your health and well-being is ensured. I just wanted to acknowledge our incredible Maryland state employees. Well, thank you, Assistant Secretary. You are 100% correct. We need to value our state employees. They get kicked around sometimes. Unnecessary for the frustrations that the state of Maryland residents have, but at the end of the day, they are working together uh, to make it better. So thank you. So from the, uh, we have the special assistant, Mr. Bunky Lofman, from the Department of Natural Resources. Now, Bunky started his public service working for the city of Salisbury in the Public Works Department. During that time, he was elected uh, as, town, uh, as a town commissioner in Del Mar and was appointed as deputy mayor and also served as chair for the Planning and Zoning Commission for both Del Mar, Maryland, and Del Mar, Delaware. He started his state service as a legislative aide for Delegate Carl Anderton and then joined the Hogan administration as the Eastern Shore Intergovernmental Affairs Representative. Currently is the special assistant to the Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources, Ms. Jeannie Hadaway Riker. Funky, please. The, the first thing I wanted to tell you is I, uh, I suffer from what I'll call a resting mean face. So I, I am not in fact angry. This is just how I look. So my boss gets asked if I'm her bodyguard all the time. So some of you may have thought, why is her bodyguard sitting up there? I don't know. Um, but Amanda Pollock's here from the city of Salisbury, and I saw her, and I started thinking of, you know, kind of my first days working for the city of Salisbury, and I had one huge takeaway from the city of Salisbury. This is something you may never hear again in your life. I met my wife at a wastewater plant <laughs> at the city of Salisbury. So, where she's now the uh, superintendent of uh, the city of Salisbury. Uh, so for DNR, I wanted to talk about a couple things. Uh, we have a Grants Gateway where we have taken, um, you would have several different ways and methods to apply for grants, so we've made it really efficient. You go to the website and um, it's streamlined, so you have one way in to, to look at our grants. Which, which makes it you know, an, incredibly helpful for anyone that you know, would, would be interested in that. And that's for not just government, but non-government, as well as academic uh, institution. It's really a one-stop shop. Uh, I also wanted to bring up uh, Fair Hill in Cecil County. Some of you may, may not know about We have a state park there. Uh, so Fair Hill, the state has invested $25 million into the park, and not, not just the racetrack, but the park as a whole, but the racetrack is going to be host uh, to the uh, five-star event. There's only six other five-star events in the world, and uh, it will be number seven. There's only one other in the country, and that's in Kentucky, So we'll be, which, of course, people associate with horses, so we'll, we'll be number two, and of course, we're 
were part of the Triple Crown. So people associate Maryland with horses, and this will uh, up that branding, and, and people will you know, be going to Cecil County for this event. And uh, it's, a, it's wonderful. The, uh, the construction has been underway for a, a time now, and it is on time. So that event uh, will be in October the 16th to 18th. So I uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I want to talk about was the EC Network. We uh, partnered with Alma Former. Uh, she's right there from um, the Economic uh, Development Administration. Uh, so we got a grant from, from them for uh, economic adjustment strategy for the forestry industry. We also partnered with Secretary Schultz, and then the, the uh, Department of Commerce is a huge uh, stakeholder in this. And what this is going to allow us to do, because as you heard Senator Edwards talk, uh, mentioned before, we had Verso that uh, you know unfortunately went out of business after 131 years. Uh, but we, we have also, over time, we've shed some jobs in, in that sector with, with different lumber mills and things like that. So this economic uh, adjustment strategy is going to allow us to sort of see exactly what we have in Maryland, what opportunities we have, what stock assessment we have, and also uh, what the markets look like outside of Maryland, potentially in Europe and, and different places like that. And we really believe that this is going to be a game changer for the forestry sector, and we're really excited about it. And uh, Scott Warner from the Midshore Regional Council was really instrumental in that. Dan Ryder from, from our forestry division and, and DNR, and Josh Smith from Western Maryland RCND. And you'll have to ask him what RCND stands for because I forgot again. <laughs> but That's Resource Conservation Development. Resource Conservation Development. So, uh, so we have a ton of partners, which is great. Uh, and one, one of the things also that um, the secretary, uh, I think, has one of the traits I love, she has a bias for action. So when this, when we get this done and we get this economic uh, adjustment strategy paper, it is not going to be thrown on a shelf somewhere. This will be a living plan where we implement it and we do create a positive uh, change, you know, not, not prosperity for prosperity's sake, as, as Secretary Schultz said, but, you know, prosperity that, that creates a difference. Uh, the other thing that uh, a lot of you know about is, you know, of course, pro, uh, program open space comes, comes through uh, Department of Natural Resources, where we put millions and millions of dollars on state, state side and local side, so if you have potential projects, keep uh, people, you know, contacting us about those. And then uh, I also wanted to mention the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, they have a uh, subcommittee that, that uh, allows departments, and I know our, our intergovernmental affairs team, there's Gretchen Hardman from Southern Maryland, Mark Widmeyer from Western Maryland, Ryan Snow from Eastern Shore, they're really invested in the uh, subcommittee from, from Commerce. So this allows all of our agencies to get together and talk to each other and sort of end those silos in communication so that we can kind of partner and, and see uh, bring more to the table and bring more expertise to the table and get uh, projects done quicker, more efficiently, and, and better using everyone's expertise. So I have a couple questions that um, if those representing commons, or those representing the environment, or those representing natural resources, uh, if you'd like to answer, great. If not, we will not deduct that from your final score, uh, which you in the audience will be voting the winner. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, how has commerce, environment, or natural resources, um, how are those departments working to support businesses in the rural areas? Secretary Schultz. Yeah, so thank you. Um, in, in all the same ways that we're helping to support businesses in every other part of the state, which is kind of the short answer. But I want to know, want you to know that obviously there are some tweaks, right? There are differences in the regions of the state that need different types of um, resources. And that's where um, Funky has talked about our regional resource team. And I don't know if there's any other members of the regional resource team here today. I know I saw Mindy Burgoyne from the Commerce team. I don't know if anyone else is here. Maybe just stand up, raise your hand if you're a regional resource team member. I, I know I see you. Stand up. Anybody else? 
Ryan, you're one. I mean, Gretchen, you're one. You all have to know that you're on the team, right? I mean, that's step number one. All right. So basically what, what that does is it breaks up the state into five specific regions. The governor in 2015 put together a governor's commerce sub cabinet. There are 10 state agencies. The two other eight state agencies here are, are a part of that as well as transportation, Department of Labor, Housing, Community Development. Right, it's a pretty broad group of, of individuals in the governor's cabinet that get together every other month to talk about relieving barriers and building types of opportunities. So this past year, when I came over to the Department of Commerce, I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had our entire agencies coming together in order to be able to participate in removing those barriers and creating opportunities for businesses all across the state. And so we took each and every one of our liaisons, over 100 of them, got together in March, broke themselves up, in many cases met each other for the very first time. It was kind of interesting to see somebody from transportation not knowing they were actually working alongside somebody from the Department of Housing and Community Development, but they actually were. So we've alleviated, as Bucky said, those silos, and we've created this team, and it's working out really well. We just had our cabinet meeting um, this week, and we had those teams report up to us, and it's interesting what we can see as far as trends. So that's number one. You're getting the best customer service than I think you have ever received in the history of customer service in the state of Maryland. So that's number one way in which we're helping to, um, to work with businesses. But it's a lot of connections. Right? So anybody that is out there in manufacturing, you know about the Manufacturing More Jobs for Marylanders Act. And rural Maryland seems to be a hotbed right now for those manufacturing type jobs um, in all different types of industries. So we're really excited about being able to help with that with Governor Hogan creating this new tax credit program. Now in the state of Maryland, we are number two in manufacturing growth on the eastern half of the United States. Just gonna just going to repeat that, just so that you know, number two in manufacturing percentage growth on the eastern half of the United States, second only to South Carolina, where everybody thinks all the manufacturing growth is going. But we've got a lot going on here because we've been able to develop those very specific types of programs, and a lot of those manufacturing jobs are coming to your neighborhoods. And that's really important because that is bringing, obviously, that extra revenue back and, and very much different types of, of manufacturing and different types of training. We're, we're able to help individual companies that are out there. So I mentioned Mindy on my team on the Eastern Shore. She's a busy girl. She travels all the way up and down that highway every day, all day, talking to businesses and talking to them about exactly what they need. Are they going to grow and are they going to expand? Well, if so, we want to be able to help them, just like we were able to help Sherwood-Williams in Somerset County and their growth and expansion so that they would stay in Maryland, right, to be able to make sure that we kept those jobs right here and they're not traveling to some other part. And, and Firefly in Garrett County. Has anybody been to Firefly? Yeah, right? So when we, when my team and I go out to Garrett County, or I, uh, they bring shopping bags, those cold sacks with them, so that they can travel back to the eastern part of the state and have everything in their coolers coming from Firefly. But being able to help that manufacturer that manufacturer grow in that type of an environment is really very, very important. And we have different tax credits and things that are helping them along the way in order to be able to do that. Alleviating the barriers is something really important. Being able to work with our partners at the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of the Environment in order to be able to get American salmon to plant themselves here in Maryland, which we were very fortunate to have um, a tour at IMET. Um, talking about the wonderful aquaculture and um, agritourism type that, that's coming from these different types of environments. Innovation is Maryland's number one asset right now. Being able to use innovatively our technology that we have all across the state that comes through many times our university systems in Western Maryland, Eastern Maryland, and everything in between to be able to develop those ideas and transfer those innovative ideas commercially to the market is something that is in our grasp of being able to be the number one state in the nation as to what we can do. We can't do that without a lot of hard work, 
from all of us being able to help them grow beyond that initial seed phase and go into their expansion phase and hire those individuals. Those individuals, by the way, which Maryland has the most PhDs of anybody else in the entire country, more PhDs are here in the state of Maryland than in any other part of the country. We're going to continue to put them to work. One thing we know is that sometimes, and we had this conversation the other day, scientists are not exactly business people all the time. I'm not saying that some aren't good at both, but being able to provide that uh, mentorship and that expansion into the business world is really important. And I'm not going to um, hold short without saying that we do have the more Commission the Maryland Outdoor Recreation Commission, which many of you may have heard about and possibly even been a part of with the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Commerce out there for the last couple of years, talking about how to increase outdoor recreation revenues that are coming. I mentioned a little bit ago, $18.1 billion in our tourism industry in the state of Maryland. That we have to continue to grow. And not only grow in the way where we want to attract visitors here just so that they can enjoy our tourism activities, but we want to attract those businesses here so that the businesses that are doing the manufacturing and those other types of um, business incentives that go along with outdoor recreation, we want them to be headquartered in the state of Maryland knowing that we are here and we are open for them and we're open for business. So those are just a few ways, Delegate, that we're helping businesses. In Thank you, Madam Secretary. Anyone? So uh, I think the forestry grant is uh, one way that, that we're working with business, but also this is more of an abstract thing. I think uh, when I've talked to uh, local executives, I live in Wicomico County, one of the things that sort of our area is called very struggled with sometimes was in getting talent come there. Uh, they ask about schools and they ask about quality of life issues, which includes parks and things like that. And as Wicomico has sort of invested more in the schools, invested more in parks and, and outdoor recreation, they've seen that reverse. And, and you know, they have a huge renaissance going on in their, their downtown region. But a part of that is due to the quality of life and investing in that through, you know, parks and, and outdoor opportunities. Environment. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think the first thing, and, and just personally, is, is breaking down those barriers, the us and them, the, the rural versus the urban. Um, we are so interdependent on each other, um, and, and the future is bright only where we find ways to relate to each other and talk to each other. Um, you know, at MDE, we permit both urban and rural communities. Um, we, we are uh, actively involved in water supply issues so the town of Pittsburgh and the Senator Rosa to ensure that the town of Pittsburgh has good quality water. Um, as we move forward, water supply and our infrastructure is going to continue to be an area we want to pay a lot of attention to. Septics. Septic is a major, it can be a barrier or an opportunity for growth in rural communities. So managing our septics wisely and balancing those needs is an area that we are actively engaged in. Um, of course, um, planning for change. In Somerset County, we've been working to streamline the permit process for good management and making sure that small uh, counties with limited staffing can get through sometimes the owners or what feels like owners come in. So anything that we can do to help a rural community be successful, we want to be there for these. We want to be there for the citizens of America. So we have a couple more minutes before our time expires. So I'm going to actually uh, go off script. <laughs> and just recently, the governor had um, announced the in 2020 would be the year of the woman. And if you've not seen his video, which had all of the women in leadership, I ask you to look at your emails because it's there. And it's celebrating the 100th anniversary to a woman's right to vote. And young ladies, yes. <laughs> I just want to ask how that impact, number one, the governor acknowledging it, number two, 
what kind of impact you believe that has for our rural communities, but even more especially you personally, what does that mean? So, Secretary Schultz. Well, thanks. So yesterday was a great day for many, many reasons, but being able to uh, kind of kick off that um, event for the governor to proclaim 2020 as the year of the woman uh, was pretty extraordinary on a lot of different levels. Um, but I think when we talk about what it means for the state to understand the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we're not only going to be celebrating the 100 years that it took us to get here to the 100th anniversary and everything that was involved in the changes that were made. We're going to be celebrating the women that are here today, that are, um, that are proving that equality and leadership is in our ranks and it's in our grasp and it is a reality. But we're also, more importantly, I think, going to be teaching all of those young women we had no idea, like many of us in this room, the struggle that it had taken in order to be able to get to those, those high levels of leadership that they are capable of and that they are qualified for and that they never knew wasn't an opportunity or a possibility for them. And the mentorship that we're able to, um, to, to work through the system but I think it also, being the mother of two sons, allows us the opportunity to also acknowledge the equality part of that. To acknowledge that there were, because we were reminded very frequently um, over the last 100 years, women were not allowed to vote on the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Men had to do that for us, right? And so, Although the women worked really hard externally in order to be able to lobby, we were some great lobbyists back then, today too, I would say, um, to get them to do exactly what we wanted them to do, so, so they did. And to be able to acknowledge those efforts and those courageous leaders that led that effort to be able to provide this to us. What does it mean for women in business? We're very fortunate here in the state of Maryland. We may not know this because it's just such an integrated part of our business world. There are more women-owned businesses in Maryland than in any other state in the nation. We are. Maryland is, for women-owned businesses, the best place to do business. We've just got it going on, right? We, we see it every single day. You see it around, around this room. And I'm just going to tell one story because we're going to push hard this year. Um, the, the, the Division of Tourism at the Department of Commerce has worked very diligently with the Women's 19th um, Amendment Commission in order to be able to provide all those tourism type opportunities and events that are going to be happening for the, for the next 12 months. So you're going to be seeing a lot of information that's going to be pushed out to you. But I'm going to tell you a little story that I told about the governor yesterday, um, which is an absolutely true story. And I think we forget how fortunate we are. But frequently, I have the opportunity to sit with the governor with other state leaders um, from across the nation and global leaders from across the world. And it's kind of interesting the way the tables are set up. It's a long table like this, and you have like all of us sitting on one side and all of them sitting on the other side, and everyone's just kind of staring at each other and you make all your introductions and all of that. Well, it has not been once or twice. It's frequently that the governor and his team will walk in and the governor will sit at the center of the table looking at the other leader, whomever that may be, and to his right and to his left are all females. And across from us are all males. And it has happened frequently where that other leader sitting across from the governor gets um, a little fidgety and says, Governor, I'm not exactly sure what you're doing, but you're doing something right, and it looks like we all need to follow your lead. And we're not there for any other reason except for the fact that we are the leaders that he chose for the right time and the right place in order to be there. So um, kudos to our governor for being our leader, and um, congratulations to all of the women and the men who we're going to be celebrating the next uh, 365 days of equality and leadership. Thank you. Dr. Dorsey, please. 
So some number of years ago, I um, was on a research boat in the middle of Chesapeake Bay at some point in February, um, and was told, stand aside, stand aside, let the men do this work. And it, it was a dilemma, because it was well-intentioned. It was really well, this was heavy lifting, uh, hard and somewhat dangerous work. And I sat there and I thought, how do I politely say thank you for your good intentions? But I must learn this to be taken seriously. And I'll tell you, at that time, I didn't figure out how to say that. I made enemies. Um, some people thought I was rude, pushy broad. Um, other people said no. And I struggled with how to overcome that. And it was at that moment that I started watching leaders and people and learning. A lot of them incredible men who did extraordinary things for me personally and mentored me um, and supported people. And it was really at that point that I wanted to make sure that no matter what I did in my life, that I supported people. That women had access, if I had access, other people needed to have access, whether they look like me or not. I wanted to be sensitive to the fact that sometimes we like to be with people who look like us. Sometimes I see right now, even in state government, that hierarchies people look like each other. And it takes courage to say, how do we change that dynamic? Nancy Nunn is sitting in the back there. She's a very quiet leader. She's the acting executive director of the Harry R. Key Center. As a scientist, I came in and wanted to make solutions based on science. And Nancy taught me that really, Suzanne, it's the relationships that make the difference. And building those relationships across disparity, across differences, is the key to success in business. It's the key to success in solving difficult environmental problems, and it's the key to success in overcoming this change. I'm being weighed down. So. But I, I, I'm so grateful to Governor Hogan for acknowledging this. I think we are all better when each of us has the opportunity to thrive, and that's why I think it's made for Thank you very much for sharing that. I would like to say that our executive branch Is, is taking it serious, and it should, and we do appreciate all the work that the governor's doing, but I also need to note that uh, Speaker Jones, uh, in a memo that's being sent out to uh, colleagues and talked about some of the things that are going to be changing in the upcoming legislation or legislature in the session, but one of them happens to speak to the amount of bathrooms that are in the back of the House of Delegates. There will be an equal amount of bathrooms and I think that uh, for both male and female and then one family. So I think it speaks to the overall leadership of the whole state of Maryland that is looking that it's time that we recognize and honor everybody in the state inclusively. So with that, I'd like you all to give our panel a round of applause again. I hope that you all have a excellent afternoon. We appreciate being here, and if there is any other positions that you need eye candy for, I can be available, so please give me a call. Thank you.